The final speaker this afternoon uh, is the recipient of the Canada Gardner Whiteman Award. This award was created uh, many years ago to recognize an individual whose scientific academic achievements and leadership in Canada is noteworthy and worthy of recognition. I can think of no one more appropriately to be recognized than Salim Youssef. In a sense, although it wasn't planned this way, it's a perfect segue from uh, Dr. Amura's talk on global health because you will hear from Dr. Youssef, his reach is global to improve the health of people around the world, recognizing many of the social determinants of health and their impact and uh, how they influence health in various populations. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Youssef, who is the professor uh, and the director uh, at McMaster University and director of the Population Health Research Institute, Dr. Youssef. Well, thank you, Henry, and uh, for those very kind words. You're an icon in Canada. And John, thank you for the marvelous efforts you put in in organizing a nationwide uh, celebration and your excellent, small, but brilliant staff. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to receive the, uh, the Canada uh, Gardner Whiteman Award and to be in the presence of this, these wonderful scientists. I'm going to tell you my story of having been born in India, worked there, then going to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, then at the NIH, and then in Canada. These are, this was the team with which I first worked. My supervisor, Peter Slight, the professor of cardiology, Richard Pito, who really is my intellectual mentor and a previous uh, Gardner Award winner. Rory Collins and I were, were colleagues together and fellows together, and the four of us did a few good things. One of the things is we wrote an article called Why Do We Need Some Large Simple Randomized Trials? This was a reflection of about seven or eight years of our work, and essentially it had two important things. The first sentence says the criteria for a good trial are similar. First and foremost, ask an important question, and second, answer it reliably. This part, identifying that important question, often takes many, many years, and answering it reliably just takes just as long, if not longer. But one of the things, as we looked at the literature, we had nothing in the 1970s to treat people with heart disease or prevent heart disease. We weren't even entirely sure that uh, stopping smoking was a good idea. We didn't know about lipids for sure, blood pressure. And we said, why is it that we have nothing? And we said, it is quite possible that many of the things we have do work, but their effects aren't large. Their effects are moderate, and that moderate effects on major outcomes are generally more plausible than larger ones. Largely because even a single condition like a heart attack had multiple mechanisms, and most medications or lifestyle changes would only influence one of these multiple medic uh, medications. And when we did uh, meta-analyses of various trials, we found that there did seem to be a signal. So we said what we need are randomized trials to avoid biases. Registries were simply not good enough. They would give us horribly misleading results. The trials needed to be much larger, but in order to be much larger, they needed to be 10 to 20 times simpler. It's very easy to collect a lot of data very hard to decide how to eliminate 95% of the data you collect in an experiment. Second, we did a meta-analysis of many uh, different treatments, and this is the second ever meta-analysis in medicine ever published. Prior to that was the one that we did on beta blockers. In this one, we took the trials of the, what is called the clot busters, or the fibrinolytic therapies, and published it in the European Heart Journal. And what we found is there were 6,000 people in 23 trials on a total of about 6,000 uh, uh, people, and there was actually a 22% highly significant risk reduction mortality. And these trials were done from 1960 to 1985, so these drugs were available for 25 years, but practically nobody was using it. 
We, along with many investigators around the world, is, uh, set out to do a series of trials. The first one was ISIS-1 that showed beta blockers saved lives. But the really striking results came from the ISIS-2 trial where we tested streptokinase given intravenously, aspirin given orally, and both for simply 35 days. Today, the two of these cost less than $75. What we found was that a third, we randomized 17,000 people, the largest trial in cardiovascular disease at that stage, and we found streptokinase reduced mortality from 12% down to 9% at 25% risk reduction. And aspirin, simple aspirin, reduced mortality from about 12% to 9%, about the same size. But what is really remarkable was that Giving the two together reduced mortality from 13 down to 8%, a 45% reduction. Imagine a 45% reduction from something $75 in those days from the world's commonest killer. That was one of the biggest steps in the field of cardiovascular disease. What we also found was although streptokinase was given as a one-hour infusion, the benefits lasted for two and a half years. But an aspirin was only given for 35 days, and the benefits lasted, and the combinations, the benefit lasted long term. Now, in the UK, the British Heart Foundation did a survey of the use of streptokinase in 1987, a, couple of, a year or two before the results came out. Only 2% of physicians considered using it for most patients, but two years after the trials came out, uh, practice changed, and 70% were using it. If today, three to five million deaths a year are, are avoided every year globally from the simple, cheap, widely practicable treatments. I then moved to the NIH in 1984, uh, uh, soon after finishing my cardiology residency. And I was fortunate to, ask, to be asked to develop the world's first large program in heart failure, along with my good friend of 35 years, Jeff Prosfield, who just walked into the room 10 minutes ago. Jeff and I and several others working at the NIH designed true trials at heart failure. At that time, mortality from heart failure was considered almost inevitable. We took people who had damage to the heart, what is called low ejection fraction, and had put them into two groups. The people who were at an earlier stage, what we call the prevention group, but no clinical symptoms of heart failure yet, and those who had low ejection fraction, the same amount of damage, but clinical heart failure with edema and shortness of breath. What we found was in the treatment trial, giving an ACE inhibitor, enalapril, at the end of the three and a half years, improved survival by an absolute of 4%. This con and con passive follow-up, not continued treatment, but passive follow of these people up to 12 years suggested that by 12 years, the curves came together, but this was a meaningful difference in longevity of about nine months. We looked at the prevention trial. At the end of the trial, we had only a very small difference, 86, about a 2% difference in survival. But without any further treatment, but passive follow-up, that doubled to four years at five at, at the five-year time point, and that difference in survival uh, increased by 6% without further treatment by 12 years, again a nine-month extension. This was the team uh, at the NIH that worked on it. Uh, we were a small bunch of people who collaborated with people across the world, and this, this is me here with less weight and more hair. <laughs> Uh, I moved to Canada at that time. The, hope, the SOLVE trial had an unexpected finding. There was a reduction in myocardial infarction in people with normal blood pressure, something totally unexpected. There was some theoretical reason that blockade of the renin angiotensin system might in animal models prevent atherosclerosis. But if this could be proven in man, it would be huge. Both SOL trials showed a highly significant reduction in myocardial infarction, but the FDA said, this is a post hoc data-derived finding, and we don't believe it. In Canada then, when Henry was the MRC uh, president, we were funded to do the HOPE study. Of 9,200 people 
from 18 countries, but 5,500 were randomized from Canada from 129 hospitals in Canada and 60 outside. And using Rampril, one of the ACE inhibitors was as placebo in people without heart failure, but high risk. We had a 22% highly significant reduction in uh, mortality. The p-value for every one of this goes off the screen. It's about seven zeros and one. It's uh, a quarter reduction in uh, uh, cardiovascular death, 20% reduction in heart attacks, 32% reduction in strokes, 23% re reduction in heart failure, prevention of angioplasties and surgery, and a third reduction in diabetes. Soon after the trial results came out, you can see without the in marketing force even getting ready to market the drug in Ontario, the use of the drugs dramatically went up tenfold. This just shows you if you get clear, overwhelming result with an inexpensive therapy, it will be adopted widely. But now, one can calculate that with the effects of ACE inhibitors in hypertension, in heart failure, and in the types of people we included in the HOPE study, we would avoid 4 million deaths per year, heart attacks, strokes, or heart failures, and revascularization procedures. And today, the cost of an ACE inhibitor in Canada is about 25 cents. So you don't need expensive therapies to save lives. Now, I remember this day in 1990, August 2nd, when Saddam Hussein uh, invaded Kuwait. On that day, a cardiologist in private practice from Chicago, had, who had been writing to me for quite a while and bugging me, and I was ignoring his letters, came to visit me at the NIH. His name was Enos. He was not a scientist, but he brought me charts of patients, and he said, many of these are uh, people Indians who got heart attacks at a very young age, and many of them were physicians. You've got to do something about it. Around that time, a friend of mine from India, Prem Pius, wrote to me and said, can I come on a sabbatical? And soon after that, I moved to McMaster, and a young student, Sonia Anand, came to work with me, and we said, why don't we work on ethnicity and cardiovascular disease? The scene on South Asians were as follows. South Asians constituted one-fifth of humanity. There were reports of high rates of premature cardiovascular disease in the UK, Singapore, East Africa, elsewhere. There was practically no data from India itself. The traditional risk factors did not explain uh, the high rate of cardiovascular disease. And if anything, South Asians were vegetarians, so they should be getting lower cardiovascular disease. We also did a study in three cities in Canada, Edmonton, Hamilton, and Toronto, and looked at three groups, South Asians, Europeans, uh, people of European origin, and Chinese, and we measured atherosclerosis because our theory was if South Asians had more cardiovascular disease, they need more atherosclerosis, but that's not what we found. What we found is as atherosclerosis increased in the Chinese, Europeans, and South Asians, there was more heart attacks. But for the same level of atherosclerosis, South Asians had much more heart attacks. That meant there was something else that was different. Maybe the plaques were different. Maybe the triggers were different, but we didn't know. Around that time, the Global Burden of Disease papers came out and showed that ischemic heart disease was the number one killer in the world and that strokes was, a, a, uh, was, was also very high. Data also showed that the majority of cardiovascular disease occurred in low and middle income countries, and these data show that one third of the world's deaths were due to cardiovascular disease, of which 80% occurred in low and middle income countries, and 86% of the burden, because the disease occurs at an earlier age, um, in South Asians, in Arabs, and in several parts of the world. So 86% of the burden was in these countries. So studying cardiovascular disease only in Western countries was really ignoring the problem worldwide. We did not have the resources to mount a large study like Framingham in different parts of the world. So we took a shortcut. This is like the Craig Venter approach to the genome sequencing. We developed a standardized case control study in 52 countries and six continents involving 14,000 cases with 
first heart attacks, and 14,000 carefully matched controls. We started with a generous grant of $25,000 from uh, Merck. Uh, a, a colleague who had worked with us on Enalapril said, I've got a bit of loose change, you can have it, you can get started. So with 25,000 we started. We wrote many grants and by that time MRC became CIHR and our grants were turned down three times before it was funded the fourth time. Ultimately, the study was funded from 50 odd sources, and we asked two questions. The first question was, is the impact of risk factors on heart attacks similar or variable in different regions or ethnic groups? Our hypothesis was that the risk factors would be different. Second, at that time, every textbook of cardiology started off with the statement that only half the causes of heart attacks were known, so we wanted to find out what the other halves were. I'm pleased to tell you both our hypotheses were wrong. Now, these were the countries, and it, this happened with, with practically no money. We gave people less than $10 per pair, and we said, I'm sorry, we don't have a lot of money, but our study is simple, would you help? They all helped. So 280 centers around the world helped for next to nothing, and this really was a movement. You really don't need mega millions for important questions as long as you can make your question inspiring and as long as you can make your study very simple. The first surprise, nine simple risk factors, many of which we knew, accounted for 90% of the heart attacks in the world. If these were causally related, it means we can prevent the majority of heart disease in the world. So we had to shift. We now needed to shift our thinking from what are the causes of heart attacks we don't know to what can we do about the causes we know? Of these, four were the most important. Abnormal lipids uh, measured by APOB by APOA ratios accounted for half. Smoking, a third. And hypertension was also more important. And this is an underestimate because hypertension uh, was measured as self-reported. If just these three were modified, we should be able to prevent the majority of cardiovascular disease in the world. There were other risk factors as well. The second thing is we looked at whether these risk factors had the same effect in different parts of the world. And this is APOB by APOA1. You can see there's a four-fold increase in the odds ratios of developing a heart attack in those with myocardial infarction compared to controls. And you can see in every region of the world, it was harmful. Western Europe, Central Europe, Middle East, Africa, South Asia, China, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, South America, and North America. The same thing with tobacco. To smoking increases the risk two and a half fold, and it was more or less the same in every part of the world. So the second part of our message was the strategy to prevent cardiovascular disease globally could be similar, but it had to be contextualized to different cultures and different economic circumstances. We then did a similar study of stroke. Stroke is much more difficult because of stroke isn't a stroke. It is a heterogeneous condition. So we needed to get MRIs in everybody, even in deepest, darkest Africa. And we've just finished a study of 13,000 cases and 13,000 controls with everybody, all the cases, getting MRIs. And we have uh, hemorrhagic strokes, ischemic strokes, and different kinds of ischemic strokes, like small vessel lacuna strokes, atherothrombotic strokes, cardioembolic strokes, and cryptogenic strokes, and subarachnoid hemorrhages. We have 3,000 hemorrhagic strokes in our study and 500 subarachnoid hemorrhages, both representing the largest series of their kinds in the world. Just like interstroke, interheart, we found that uh, nine, uh, not five, but nine risk factors accounted for 90% of all strokes, ischemic strokes, and intracerebral hemorrhage. The contribution of different risk factors to intracerebral hemorrhage versus ischemic strokes was somewhat different, but most of them mattered to more or less the same degree. Again, like in interheart, we found that 90% of the stroke risk was predicted in every region of the world. Then our questions moved to, okay, we know the risk factors, but what causes the risk factors and what can we do about the risk factors? And that's how the study PURE was born, Prospective Urban Rural Epidemiological Study. 
Our original goal was to study 120,000. We have now about 180,000. We're trying to get it to 200,000. And right now, 25 countries are participating. We published four papers in the New England Journal this year based on the first 155,000 people. They are from low-income countries, middle-income countries, and high-income countries. Uh, right now, we have 700 communities. We are targeting 900 communities. Uh, half, of the, half of the communities are urban and half are rural. We look at societal-level influences, such as socioeconomic variables. What causes tobacco to be used? You know, cultural aspects, advertising, beliefs, other health policies, relative food prices, and availability, the built environment that affects mobility, indoor and outdoor pollution. And then we look at that, their effects on health behaviors, interactions with genes, to give you the risk factors, and then study a range of chronic diseases, and I'm going to only focus on cardiovascular disease. I really think this cohort should be a million people, then we'll really understand the causes of cancers, some of the neurodegenerative diseases, uh, and some of the uh, rarer uh, conditions, like Parkinsonism, which are important. It is possible if we all come together, and if some philanthropist will put in a little bit of money. Now, these are the countries at, uh, uh, these are the, this is the map of the world. We have uh, five continents. I'm pleased to say uh, that in addition to North and South America, Africa, East and Western Europe, Russia has just joined, uh, Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and uh, I, I just got a letter three days back saying three Central Asian republics will join, and we're desperately trying hard to get Australia in so that we have bragging rights that every continent of the world uh, where it is feasible to get informed consent from human beings, not from penguins, can join. So these are the environmental factors we're studying, tobacco, food, socioeconomic factors, built environment, air quality, water, soil. I'll just give you one. We had to develop new methods to measure the environment. And what we have is a photographic map of the 900 communities around the world, in addition to a self-reported assessment. In the photographic map, we sent research assistants uh, using a standardized method to the center of a community and take a photograph looking forwards, looking side, right, to the back, to the left. They cross the street, they do it, and they go on a one square kilometer controlled walk. I can tell you our research assistants lost weight. This is what a high school for an environment looks like in Canada. You will see there are trees, there are shops, that means there's a destination to walk to, there are sidewalks. This is what a low scoring community in Canada scores. No sidewalks, very little trees, few destinations to walk to. Using this, we looked at obesity, and you'll see in Canada, as the architecture and the design of the community improves, BMI goes down. Surprisingly, we found exactly the opposite in low and middle income countries. As the architecture improved, obesity went up because this is where the richer people lived. They ate more, they had cars, and they exercised less. The next question we asked, and this is what our New England Journal paper recently was, was why does 80% of the cardiovascular disease occur in low and middle income countries? Is it because most of the world lives in low and middle income countries, in which case it's just a numerical issue? Or is it because they have higher risk factors? Or is it that they have more disease? Or is it once they get their disease, their case fatality rates are higher? The first thing we did was we looked at their risk score, and from the Interheart study, we had come up with an integrated risk score called the Interheart risk score. Much to our surprise, the highest rates of, of risk scores was in the rich countries, intermediate in the middle-income countries, and lowest in the low-income countries, and that was a surprise because the rates of cardiovascular disease was exactly the opposite. So it was lowest, uh, major cardiovascular disease, that is heart attack, strokes, and heart failure, was lowest in the high-income countries, intermediate in middle-income countries, and highest in low-income countries like India or Zimbabwe. 
non-major cardiovascular disease that is being admitted for angina or revascularization showed exactly the same opposite pattern, which meant that these diseases were being picked up earlier in the richer countries, intervened upon, and therefore we prevented getting here. And you, if you look at fatal cardiovascular disease, you're getting exactly the same trend, a tenfold difference for the same condition in mortality. And that is shown even more in what is called the annualized case fatality rates. So for heart attacks, for strokes, for heart failure, for major cardiovascular disease and all cardiovascular disease, the mortality rates in the poorer countries were five to tenfold higher. This means healthcare and health systems matter. And a simple example of it is simple, proven, inexpensive therapies. There are marked differences in their use between rich and poor countries. And you will see antiplated agents, aspirin. Even in Canada, only 60% of the people who should be getting it get it. But look at low-income countries, 5 to 10%, and the middle-income countries, this is upper middle, this is low middle, are in between. Same thing with beta blockers, same thing with ACE inhibitors. And look at statins, it's virtually unused in large parts of the world. So one of the, the challenges is how do we get proven therapies actually used? I can show you the same data with hypertension, with primary prevention, with a lot of other things. But we learn certain conceptual uh, principles in epidemiology. First, that biological risk factors are deterministic. So if you've got high lipids, whether you're Indian, Chinese, African, Martian, uh, Venetian, whatever, it increases your risk of heart attacks. But social factors are contextual, and their interactions can be variable. Third, variations in health system are a bigger impact on differences in disease and mortality than even risk factors. And understanding and intervening at all three levels is what is needed to prevent uh, uh, disease and death, uh, at least premature death. In the last three to four minutes of my talk, I can tell you where our field of intervention is going to. About 12 years back, after the heart protection study was published, I wrote a back of the envelope editorial in The Lancet where I did a calculation. If after a heart attack, people received none of the preventive measures, their death rates two years after a heart attack would be 8%. This is after they survived the first month. If you gave aspirin, eight would be reduced by a quarter down to six. If you gave beta blockers, it would be reduced by another quarter, so six will go down to four and a half percent. If you gave them a statin, uh, it would go down by a third, so four and a half would go to three. And if you gave an ACE inhibitor, it would be reduced by a quarter down to 2.3. But if you managed to give all four at a low cost to people who needed it, eight would go down to 2.3%, a 75% risk reduction. And Richard Peter and I used the word combination therapy. But a year or two later, Professor Sir Nick Wald wrote this brilliant series of articles in the BMJ where he theorized that a pill that a polypill where you combine these things can prevent 80% of heart attacks globally. The editor, Richard Smith of the BMJ, said, I suggest, he first said, he thinks it's the most important BMJ for 50 years. And then he su said, I suggest gentle or even angry, because if this was successful, it'll put all cardiologists out of business. It, that you keep this issue of the BMJ, it may well become a collector's item. He goes on to say that if the polypill really works, all cardiologists would have to train uh, retrain and become psychiatrists. And then he goes on to say, if we create a poly pill for depression and call it a happy pill, all psychiatrists will be out of a job. So we then worked with an Indian pharmaceutical company to develop a poly pill that has an aspirin, a statin, an ACE inhibitor, a beta blocker, and a thiazide, all of which we chose were generics so that the daily cost of this would be under 10 cents per person per day. This was important. And we then did two trials, and we estimated that based on the lipid lowering, the blood pressure lowering, and the antiplated effects, it would reduce coronary heart disease by 70 to 80%, and strokes by two-thirds to three-quarters. 
we are now doing three big trials. The first of these, called HOPE 3, will finish in just over a year, involving 12,700 people, where moderate risk people without cardiovascular disease are randomized to blood pressure lowering using an, uh, a angiotensin receptor blocker and thiazide. It really doesn't matter what. It lower, combination therapy lowers blood pressure quite a bit, and a statin versus placebo, and then we'll be able to find out what the individual contributions and the combined contributions are. With the help of the Wellcome Trust, we've been funded to do a study of the entire polypill, the five things, uh, in low and middle income countries, India and Philippines are going, Tanzania, has joined, three South American countries will join soon, Bangladesh will join soon, as will China and Malaysia, and the results of this is expected at, in 2018. And HOPE4 is a trial where we have money for the pilot, we're hoping to do the full scale, and the pilot has just started in Colombia and Malaysia in 50 communities where we are now taking an implementation strategy and evaluating it. And we don't think for an epidemic like cardiovascular disease, there are enough doctors in the world to, to be effective. So we're taking uh, community health workers or non-physicians who are who have very low training, nothing more than high school, getting them to screen high-risk people for blood pressure using automated devices and simple questions, and then giving them a poly pill uh, with long-distance supervision by physicians and lifestyle modification versus usual care. Now, the pilot will finish in two years, and the full scale, if we get funded, will finish in 2020. The poly pill will revolutionize cardiovascular disease. I'm optimistic. First, it is low cost. It will not produce $25 billion for any drug company, and that has been one of the biggest barriers. We're finding big problems in people investing it, but it will, might save 25 billion lives. Uh, it is simple, well, you know, that's a bit of exaggeration, but uh, it's low cost, simple, safe, and well tolerated. It could prevent a very large proportion of cardiovascular disease uh, when used in combination with lifestyle change, especially avoidance of tobacco. Its potential impact could be as much as preventing 10 to 15 million deaths and premature cardi cardiovascular disease events globally every year. And the key thing is it may be a paradigm for change in healthcare when non-physicians are going to be the foot soldiers and make it even simpler. Remember, cardiovascular disease is the biggest epidemic mankind has ever known, ever known. We can't manage this one patient at a time by high-tech specialists. We need a whole new paradigm, and the polypill may help us get there. This is a wonderful team of people uh, who work with me closely um, uh, on the polypill and others and the epidemiological studies. They're supported by another cast of 250 people in our institution. These are the collaborators around the world. And one of the best things of collaborating globally is you have meetings in interesting places. That is Lake Louise in Alberta. This, of course, as you know, is Sydney. This is Toledo in Spain. These are the pyramids of Giza. And this you won't recognize is Beijing, China, because outside the hotel, there was so much fog, you couldn't take a photograph. <laughs> so I will end up and tell you where my journey has taken me over six continents and over 35 years. To quote my favorite poet, Tagore, I'll say, I have found friends among strangers and homes in faraway lands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Youssef. I think you'll agree those of you who were able to participate in the full afternoon, we've been enriched by the series of three lectures, each addressing a different topic of, of great importance and great interest. And we have been privileged to hear the world's authorities on these subjects. They've inspired us, they've moved us. Before I turn the podium over to John Dirks, let me say on your behalf to him, John, your passion and your commitment and your leadership of the Gardner Foundation has elevated to the high rank it enjoys today, and we're indebted to you for your commitment to that. John Dirks. Well, thank you very much, Henry, for those 
warm remarks. I don't know quite how to take that. But I want to thank you for chairing this afternoon session and Alison Buchan for chairing this uh, morning session. We've heard eight great talks today. Tremendous uh, uh, difference, all of a high quality. A lot of uh, great basic science, a lot of clinical application. In fact, it created a lot of hope hearing about the new cancer uh, therapies and, uh, that are on the miraculous side. Learning again about cardiovascular disease uh, in terms of what could be done on a large scale inexpensively in many, many lands. Hearing about uh, uh, intractable diseases such as river blindness that for the first time in the history of mankind are changing rapidly so that are come close to being eliminated in African riverbeds. So it's a great story and it's a tribute to the uh, great achievements of the eight people that Gardner has uh, honored this year and will honor specifically at a ceremony tonight at the Royal Ontario Museum. I want to thank our good sponsors from the governments, in particular University of Toronto and the University Health Network for their sponsorship of this uh, event today. And in addition, I want to whet your appetite for tomorrow because what we often do is emanating from the topics, the interests of the speakers, we develop a symposium. And uh, when we chose both uh, Jim Allison and uh, Hal Dvorak and uh, Napoleon Ferreira, we thought this is a good time to have uh, a symposium on the biology and treatment of cancer, considering the new advances. So I would, it's going to start tomorrow here at 8.45. Cal Stiller is going to start it off with a little intro. And we have, uh, uh, I believe, eight or nine outstanding speakers. It'll finish with a round table. Uh, the registration is very high. I suggest you come early. Uh, at the same time, we're going to have, uh, uh, emanating from the work of Drs. Manny and Feldman, and working with the Arthritis Alliance here in Ontario and Canada, uh, they moved their meeting from Winnipeg to Toronto so they could take advantage of the fact that both uh, Mark and Ravinder were here. And we've, but they, they said, we'll come and stay if you make it as cutting edge. And we brought in a number of cutting edge immunologists, systems biologists, and other scientists to see where the future lies. And that's going to be held over at the Toronto Eaton Centre Marriott Hotel, and that starts at 8.30. So I want to tantalize you enough to come back and uh, hear all these excellent talks, and many of the summit speakers will also be with us tonight at the dinner. So thank you all for being here, for being patient, for listening carefully all day. I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope it's been an inspiration to you all. Thank you. <laughs>